Next, on the OHIO podcast, we discuss Ohio State's 18th trip to the Rose Bowl, whether Garrett Wilson will play in the bowl game or not, and the departure of one Quinn Ewers. And that all starts right now. It's so easy to be average. You know it as well as I know it. It takes a little something to be special, Don. It takes a little something special to be a great player. We don't have enough great players. The hell with that! We don't want to coach average. I don't want to be around you. Why be around average? proud of our young people in the classroom, in the community, and most especially in 310 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the football field. Three things. Number one, the team that hits the hardest and the longest, the team that starts the fastest, and the team is too damn smart to make mistakes. If you take it to them, if you don't make mistakes, and you keep taking it to them, hell, there's no question who win. It's time for the best Buckeye podcast by fans for the fans where they hate that team up north as much as you do. It's time for the OHIO podcast. OHIO! Welcome back to the OHIO podcast, everybody. I'm your host, Buckeye Boggs, recording live from a chilly and still somewhat somber north central Ohio. I am joined by my both my co-hosts today from Fort Hood, Texas, Aaron Brown, and from Marion, Ohio, Chris Wilds, the wild man. How you doing today, Aaron? I'm doing great. How are you? Great, Chris. How are you? Oh, man, I couldn't be better today. I'm, I'm feeling good. Had a great night at the poker table last night. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that that always eases the pain of not having some Ohio State football to watch. So Beautiful, beautiful. You know what else is doing good? That's Spire. If you're not satisfied with pickup games and unranked matches, chances are you're aiming higher than most. At Spire, you'll train to be the best. Whether you're drawn to the pool, track, map, basketball court, or gaming controller, we provide the training you need to achieve your dream. Make our facilities your home or take advantage of free transportation services. Are you ready to unlock your potential? Visit SpireCleveland.com today. There are four really happy programs today as the College Football Playoff Committee has announced the top four teams in the playoffs following yesterday's championship uh, games and we had some upsets. Uh, one of us may have called one of the big upsets. <clears throat> Not want to tune anybody's horn, but we'll get into that at the end of the show. <laughs> we'll get into you can toot all you want, buddy. But what I predicted happened. Just saying. So um, we we have some things we need to talk about. And we need to dissect. But first things first, Chris, since you're tooting over there. Give me the top four in the CFP, man, and your response to who is in and who they left out. Uh, you know, we, we've got Alabama in there after their big win over Georgia. We have that team up north coming in at number two. You got Georgia and you got Cincinnati. I'm telling you, uh, you know, I, I'm happy for Cincinnati, happy for the fighting fickles. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a great opportunity for them. Uh, definitely a huge task in uh, tackling Alabama in that first game. But, uh, you know, I think if any of the smaller programs are up to it, it's going to be Fickle and Cincinnati. Um, I, I can't be mad about it. I mean, you've got an undefeated conference champion in Cincinnati. The SEC, we, we called it from the beginning of the year. We knew they were going to probably have two teams in based on what was going on. Uh, from the beginning of these ratings on. And uh, that team up north, all I'm going to say is, we had our shot. They earned it. More power to them. Enjoy this when you're going to be going on another eight-year run here real soon. Aaron, you want to you wanna respond to the CFP? And I, I mean, I've got some feelings, but I want to hear yours first. Yeah, it's... 
it, it it ended up panning out the way that I kind of thought it would with Cincinnati at four, Bama at one, Georgia at three, and that team up north at two. The only thing I can say to that team up north is you guys better bring this home. Like they need to bring this whole championship back to the Midwest because they're going to have to bring it from the south. And it starts with Georgia because I'm going to be honest, I as much as I would love for Cincinnati to run the table and do this thing, they're not going to. This has a vibe of like Ohio State versus Miami, Florida from back in 0203 that season. But the odds are much worse. Like, I, I to me, they have like a 1% chance of beating Alabama because they're not that physical compared to Alabama. You know, uh, if if Michigan can bring the violence to Georgia and then to Alabama, that's going to play in their favor. But the way that Alabama plays defense, and I'm getting into a little bit of breakdown here, but they, they run mixed coverages, you know, like cover five, cover six. And it's it can confuse young quarterbacks and Cade McNamara already has issues. He's not the greatest quarterback. So can he read those defenses? Can Jim Harbaugh get him up to snuff that fast? We'll find out. Yeah, because if, if they're going to win this thing, it's going to be on his arm because the I'm telling you right now, now George is going to load up the box. Well, how creative can Josh Gaddis get? That's what. Yeah. That's what's going to get them past Georgia is creativity. Can they outcreate Georgia's defense? That remains to be seen. <clears throat> Number one, um, we are all, we are all, everybody, myself included, we're all wrong about Georgia. That that Alabama made them look silly yesterday. I thought Georgia's defense was much better than that, and obviously they're not. So I guess kudos to Bama, but still, it's like. Um, how good really is the SEC? I mean, we're going to find out. I mean, if, if the team up North goes in there and they wax Georgia, then at this point, can we, can we just all as collectively as a nation point our fingers down South and go, really guys, ESPN, really? Can we stop putting two of these guys in every, every year? Um, that's ridiculous. I think. I honestly, as much as I hate to say it, I don't think Bama should be number one. I really think it should be that team up north. You look, you go back and you look at Bama and who they barely survived and then who they lost to. And then look at uh, the team up north's results to their schedule. Uh, I think they should be one. I think uh, Bama and Georgia should be two, three. And they should play again. But we all predicted it that they weren't going to do that. And of course the committee is like, Oh, I had nothing to do with it. These are the four teams and how we rank them. And that's not true. That's not true for one second. And they're setting this thing up. They think they're setting this thing up for another Georgia, Alabama national championship rematch. And quite frankly, go Luke fickle. Just mess the whole thing up for everybody at this point. Please. I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Um, I'm, I'm going to be rooting for Cincy. Um, as much as I don't want to say it, I kind of wish now that the, the, the college football playoff was expanded at least slightly. I still think six teams is perfect. Obviously, I think they're going to go to 12, which is going to kind of water it down for me a little bit. But this is the year, I think, where you could look at it and say anything could happen. And Ohio State has a, has the, has a good enough offense to win a national championship. I was thinking about this this morning. This is the second year in a row. I feel like our offense has been been good enough for a national championship and the defense is nowhere up to par to win one. And it, again, it's bit us in the butt two years in a row. You put 2019's defense on 2020's with 2020's offense and 2021's offense, we're national champions. I just wish there was a way that the stars would align for, for Ryan Day and this coaching staff to where – You've got a great defense and an unbelievable offense all at the same time. And that just hasn't happened lately. Um, I think CFP, if I was in that room, I don't know how you make an argument for anybody else. Can you make an argument for Baylor with two losses? Can you make an argument for Notre Dame? Not when they lost to Cincinnati. Like, I, I don't know. Is there any other team you could put into this thing other than those four, Chris? <sighs> I don't think so. I, I think these were the teams that, you know, you know, as you said, 
Alabama, until they beat Georgia, I don't think they belonged in the top four. Once they beat Georgia, I think you have to give it to them. Um, no, I don't think there's anybody outside of that that really has an argument. I think, you know, everybody, everybody else is, is two losses for the most part or more, even the conference champions. So, no, I don't, I don't think you can go any other direction. Aaron, can you come up with anybody else? No, no, I really can't. You you have to put Cincinnati in there. They're the only undefeated team in college football. So that's a shoe in to me. I'm glad that a group of five, as they're called, gets an opportunity this time. Uh, Alabama taking down Georgia, like Chris said, I think that they earned that shot now. Um, Georgia did really well all season. I think they deserved it. And as good as Michigan's coming on, I, I can't. Can't exclude them either. Notre Dame shouldn't get it because, well, obviously they lost to Cincinnati. Ohio State, two losses. I think six is a good spot for them, although I think five would be better because I do think we're better than Notre Dame. But it is what it is. Doesn't matter. We're not in the playoffs even at five. So, uh, no, at the end of the day, I cannot make an argument for anyone else. As we record this right now, they are announcing um, the bowl games for – uh, the coming weeks, the weeks to come, I think we get started on December 17th, if I'm not mistaken, is the first one. And that game's already been announced between Middle Tennessee, Middle Tennessee and Toledo, uh, the Bahamas Bowl. That would not be a bad bowl to go to. Just saying Bahamas. I'd take that uh, Friday, December 17th. Not 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 as far as like Ohio State going in the matchup, but I would take the uh I take the location, I guess is what I'm saying on that one. But Friday, December 17th. So next weekend, we will have our bowl preview where we will give our predictions for all the bowl games, including the Bahamas Bowl and the famous Cheez-It Bowl. Gosh, I hope Clemson goes to the Cheez-It Bowl. Just saying. Did you see my meme? I did see your meme. I thought it was hilarious. I want more memes of... Dabo Sweeney and Cheez-Its uh, if they go. I just I think it's the greatest thing ever if it happens. Anyways, we're going to get into that. But Ohio State, Utah, the Rose Bowl. Interestingly enough, you posted it earlier, um, Aaron, from Jeff Snook. Uh, by the way, I think he's the best, uh, best reporter out there. Um, Ohio State and Utah have only played one time before. This is the first time Ohio State's going to the Rose Bowl, not being a Big Ten champion. Ohio State is 8-7 and seven all-time at the Rose Bowl. I think they're on a three-game winning streak at the Rose Bowl. Let's see if I can remember them. You've got Washington last time, Oregon before that. Uh, who was before? Oh, Arizona. Arizona, Arizona. State. Yep. 90, 97. Arizona State. Those are the last three Rose Bowl games. And we're going to add Utah to that. And I think this is Utah's first Rose Bowl ever. So interesting matchup. Um, I'm a little scared. I ain't going to lie. I have not watched Utah a ton. But what I have seen, Aaron, this looks like a bad matchup for us. Yeah, I, I've i actually watched about four games of theirs this season. And they're physical. And what is the issue with our defense? They are not physical, so <laughs> this could be a nightmare for Ohio State because we can't seem to stop physical teams, and we can't move the ball against physical teams. So I guess it's going to depend on our level of uh, preparation. You know, uh, Do they come in here pissed off that they lost two games, they lost to Michigan, they're going to redeem themselves against Utah or are we going to have a bunch of guys sitting out giving up on the season don't really care because it's not the playoffs you know how does Ryan Day respond to the last game and get these guys up for a prestigious bowl game like the Rose Bowl because this is this is going to matter some people are like well it's just the Rose Bowl it's not the playoff who cares well, if you're a recruit watching a nationally televised game in the oldest and perhaps most prestigious bowl game in all of the bowl games outside of the national title game, this matters. And Ryan Day knows it. All the staff knows it. If you get embarrassed on national television, that's a real bad look to the recruiting scene. I will tell you that much. So we'll find out how Ryan Day gets these guys ready for this. 
Chris, your response to Ohio State taking on Utah in the Rose Bowl, our 16th Rose Bowl appearance as a program. Well, all I'm going to say, and it's kind of reiterating what Aaron said, is these guys had better be prepared. Ryan Day had better have these guys up. Utah is a really, really well-coached football team. Uh, from what I've seen, again, I haven't seen a whole lot of them, but they do seem very disciplined. Um, and as Aaron said, they are very physical. If we are not up for this game, this could be a huge slap in the face. I think we will yeah. be. I've got confidence in Day, but you know what? We better be. This reminds me, Aaron and, and, and Chris, and I know you guys will remember this. I remember a few years where we had really good teams in the 90s, and we would lose to Michigan, and then we would go to a Rose Bowl, and we would just lay an egg because it, was, it just felt like the team was just – they were so deflated from the game that – the, the whatever bowl they were in, whether it was, you know, the uh, gosh, what was the uh, not Gator Bowl, but I feel like there was one ch- Outback Bowl, Outback Bowl. There it was every time we went to the Outback Bowl. We played South Carolina, I think, like two or three times in a row. Um, I remember a Liberty Bowl where we fell flat on our face. Where it was against, like, what? Well, that it gets like Air Force or BYU it or Air, something. It was Air Force. Yeah. And it was like, what? What is happening? Like, it's. This has a feel, guys, of the all those expectations came crumbling down in Ann Arbor, and the bowl game just kind of feels ugh. even though it's the stinking Rose Bowl. It's like the the granddaddy. This is like the the game, and unless these players and the leadership of this team, along with the coaching staff, gets this thing turned around. I'm really afraid we're going to have a letdown in Pasadena. And because, you know, Utah, they are ecstatic for this game, man. This is their Super Bowl. This is they just won the Pac-12. They're going to the granddaddy. They get to play the mighty Buckeyes of Ohio State. Like we are going to get a a a, a Michigan light is what we're going to get, guys. I can feel it. I can see it. And if we do not have a giant chip on our shoulder where we go in and just be like, we're going to show this committee in the world that it was a fluke in Ann Arbor and we are we are worthy to be called one of the best teams in college football. If we don't do that, I'm feeling a letdown, my man. And I'm 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 scared about it, Aaron. I really am. Well, let me. OK, so all those concerns you just expressed, I have the same ones. OK, and it made me think this week is and it may be too soon to tell okay but this is ryan day's opportunity to not be labeled john cooper 2.0 because this season has been very john cooper-esque especially at the end we have a lot of talent on the field but they can't win a big game that was john cooper's calling card i really hope ryan day does not fall into that yeah, I mean, if you look at um, what was the, what was the uh, team up north fan base's crying card for uh, Jim Harbaugh before this year, he would have nine and two teams or nine and three teams. He could he'd lose the Ohio State and then he would lose the bowl game year after year after year. And this this feels right now like unless something magical happens in Pasadena, boy, I sure hope so. I mean, I I really hope we go out there and we kick their butts. But unless it, if something like that happens, this is going to be what what that team up north did all those years before this one. And that is not what we as fans expect. Those aren't the expectations here. And you brought it up, and I got into a little bit with, with someone on our, our page about that article that was written comparing Ryan Day to John Cooper. And – what I, I I I don't think Ryan Day's John Cooper. I, I don't want to. I don't believe that, Aaron and Chris. I don't believe that at all. I I still have a lot of faith in Ryan Day, but you can see it on the little things that are happening. That everything is not peachy over there at the Woody Hayes Athletic Center, Chris. There are some cracks in the foundation. Are you worried about this bowl game, my man? Do you have the same 
trepidation or can you give me something to hang my hat on to make me feel better right now uh, four weeks out from the Rose Bowl or however many it is, three, three and a half, something like that? Uh, you know, I, I'm very worried. Um, the one thing the one thing I will say is this. Ryan Day does seem to respond from a loss in a positive way. It seems like he learns from his losses. I mean, you look at what happened with Clemson two years ago and then last year. Uh, you look uh, after the Oregon game, the stretch we ran down. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't always the prettiest, but we were winning ball games. So it seems like after a loss, he does say t- take something away from it. And hopefully he is able to take whatever it is and find a way to improve this team. Because like you said, we're getting Michigan 2.0 here against Utah. And this is a hungry team right now looking to make a name for themselves. They've done it against Oregon twice this season and and exerted their dominance on Oregon. And they're looking to come and do the same thing to Ohio State and make a national name for themselves off of this Rose Bowl. So, yeah, I'm nervous. I'm not going to lie, but I do have faith in Ryan Day and that he will do something uh, to pull this out. Good, good, good. All right. <clears throat> All right. So I, I said that there were little things that I didn't like. And one of the little things that has happened is the interview that Garrett Wilson gave, I think it was 97.1 The Fan, on Thursday or Friday. And he was asked about whether he was going to play in the Rose Bowl or not. And he came right out and said, I haven't made up, I haven't made my mind up about that yet. <sighs> Guys, I, un- I understand, but at the same time, Aaron, as a fan... <laughs> It really upsets me. How do you feel about things like that? And number one, number one, do you think he plays? And number two, um, how should we as fans look at that? Well, I mean, if he's not even sure, I cannot be sure. But I, I'll be honest, as much as they talk about the brotherhood, you're going to find out if that's real or if it's lip service. If he plays, then it's for real. And if he does not, and several others sit out as well, you're going to know that was all BS the whole time. They're not playing for each other. That was a, a bold face lie because uh, you don't just give up on your team. Look at – remember, okay, so Zeke played his final game. Joey Bosa played his final game. Uh, Chase Young, I, you know, Justin Fields. We can name all these guys that did not sit out the bowl game and look for money. You know, they're not they weren't looking ahead. They were in that moment. They wanted to win their final game. They wanted to leave a lasting impression on the University of Ohio State. So to answer your question, I can't even answer whether or not he plays because he apparently doesn't know. But I think that it's complete crap if they sit out. I understand it as a fan. Okay, it's not our decision. He has a bright future and he doesn't want to jeopardize it. Logically, it makes sense. As a fan, as a teammate, he has to play. You know, he can't just give up on his on his team, his alleged brothers. So to me, we're going to find out some things about this locker room, uh, depending on who plays and who sits out. James Laurinaitis said, if you start the season with your with your teammates, you need to finish the season with your teammates. And I thought that was well said from someone who played his heart out and gave everything he had both at Ohio State and in the NFL with mostly with the St. Louis Rams at the time. But I I just look at this and think I, I'm with James on this, man. If you're going to start the season, then finish it. Don't quit halfway through. Don't quit at the end. You know, this is the finish line. No, it's not the, the finish line you all wanted but it's the finish line to the season nonetheless. And your teammates are counting on you to be there to put forth the best effort that you possibly can so that you guys can cross the finish line together victorious. That's how I look at it. And so as a fan, this really upsets me. Chris, your thoughts. Do you think he's going to play? How should we look at this as fans? 
You know, as a fan, I'm irritated already in the fact that he's undecided. Um, you know, I'm with you guys. I think if you start the season, you finish the season. Uh, you know, you made an ob- a commitment to the university. I think you have an obligation to finish it. Now, from a very practical standpoint, if I were in his shoes, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't know that I would. This guy's looking at being possibly a top 10 pick in the NFL. He gets an injury. That's a lot of money out of his, off his, you know, out of his pocket. That's food off his dinner table. So I could definitely understand him not doing that. I think what upsets me most is dragging his feet on it. If you've made the decision, you come out and say you've made the decision so that the team can prepare without you. Okay, I don't so, like it, but, right. but I, I say, you know, you should come out and say it. So here's my thing. If he's worried about money, what was all this NIL crap about? He got money. He got paid in college for his name and likeness and image and all that good stuff. I feel like at this point, money should not be a factor as much. But it's a big difference. In it is. It is. The, it's, the it's, little, the, the, I mean, relatively, you know, it's a lot of money to you and I, but relatively small amount of money that he made off the this NIL deal versus, you know, a top 10 draft pick who's going to make multi, again, a multi-million dollar guaranteed contract out of the gate. No, I understand, you know, $70 million contract to be a top 10 pick or, or more money for that matter versus a couple million in college. I understand the difference, but I don't know. I, I guess I'm like James Laurinaitis. My loyalties lie with whatever team I'm with, and I everything's pretty much been said. You know, you started with this team. You've been there three years. Finish the job, man. Don't drag I, I agree with that as a fan, 110%. I agree with that. And like I said, it, it, it pisses me off because I can almost feel right now he's not playing. I, that's just the sense I get right now. I hope I'm wrong. No, you're not. You're not wrong, Chris, because I mean, but, if you listen to the response by him, even saying I, I haven't made a decision at this point, you, you practically have at this point. Because yeah. if your mind, if you if don't know, mindset, you know. Yeah. If your mindset isn't, I'm just going to play because I'm a player. You know what I mean? If you your mindset is all, all exactly, I would almost suggest to you if, if you're wavering. Don't play. Yeah. I mean, it, I, tell me if I'm wrong, Aaron, but if you're worried about her getting hurt, it almost means you're going to play softer. You're going to play to not get you're hurt. You're going to play scared. And, you're, and then you're going to get hurt, right? I mean, it, it, it seems like that happens every time, it seems like, Aaron. It does. It does. You're 100% right because if his mind is only half in it, he's not looking. His head's not on a swivel. That's that's the exact time that guys get hurt. That's 100% right. And to kind of think about this, you know, after what Chris said a minute ago, would you as a high schooler, and I know Quinn Ewers just did this, okay, but let's say your team is in the playoffs. You've played your 10-game schedule. You're undefeated. You're the number one seed in the state playoffs. You're going to Ohio State to play quarterback. Are you going to sit out the playoffs and just not finish the job? You're just going to go to your head coach and say, hey, coach. I know that we're in a position to win a state title, but uh, my future is pretty bright. I think I'm going to go ahead and sit these last five games out. I don't want to play in the in the playoffs. So uh, good luck to you, and uh, I'll keep in touch because that, that's what we're talking about here. That's, that, that's what Garrett Wilson's doing and anybody else that wants to sit out, and it's garbage. I don't disrespect the man. I, I have plenty of respect for him and what he's done here, but finish the job. Come on. I, guys, I think – well, here's the other thing too, is if you waver and you're taking all those first game rep or first first team reps in practice and then you don't play, you stole reps from someone who needed them who now has to play. And exactly. Is, is, that's that's the, that. So it, <clears throat> to me, if you're not gonna play, you need to let coach know right now. Yeah, so don't that, be selfish. Yeah, so that yep. those reps can go immediately to Marvin Harrison Jr. Because by the way, that's who's gonna replace him if he doesn't play because he's he's the number two behind Garrett at that position. So even even though Julian Fleming's been the one that plays, <laughs> according to what Marvin Harrison said, <clears throat> they uh, asked him 
who who in that room do you think is going to uh, really flash next season? He said Marvin Harrison Jr. I've watched him because he's at my position. He's been at my position all year. Hmm. So I kind of feel like uh, we might be seeing a little bit of uh, MHJ. Can we start that going, MHJ? Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> maybe Julian Fleming. Maybe he gets it just because of he's he's got one more year in the program. But either way, someone's going to need those reps is what I'm saying. Yeah, I only said that because yeah. when Garrett Wilson was out, Julian Fleming was the one that played in his spot, not not Marvin Harrison. And that could have been a tip of the hat to him, you know. Yeah, for sure. I'm not sure. But either way, is there anybody else that you're worried other than Garrett Wilson worried that might not suit it up? Um, I mean, the only ones that would come to mind would be like Chris Olave. But I think Chris that Olave, he's, but I, I think he is fully committed. I don't think he's got an yeah, issue he's playing a his final game. Yeah. I, so it, other it, than it, that, maybe the linemen – Nah, they're all gonna play. I, there's Thayer Munford and Olave came back. They could have went pro last year. Yep. You know what right. I mean. And they came. Yeah. They came back, so they're gonna finish this out. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I don't know NPF possibly. I but I again I just hearing him talk. I think he's all in. Um, and Lord knows there's none of those defensive players that needs to sit out. And the, the only one possibly that could in all honesty, probably say I, I don't need to play would be Haskell Garrett. But again, the dude was shot in the face and was playing football a couple weeks later. He's a football player. He's going to play. So I think it might only be Wilson possibly. All right. So there is that we're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to dive in to the portal. Aaron brought it up. Oh, there's a Texas quarterback who is taking his millions in his football and going back home. So hang tight, everybody. The OHIO podcast is brought to you by Mastermind. Mastermind specializes in 360-degree high-definition mobile video mapping, GIS integration, and traffic safety studies. Mastermind cares about traffic safety and keeping you safe on the roadway. Visit Mastermind at OnlineMastermind.com. And welcome back to the OHIO podcast. Quinn Ewers, the million dollar man, is heading back to Texas, Aaron. This news broke Friday night, kind of out of the blue. There has been a lot of rumors swirling around. I'm just going to turn my mic off and let you two guys talk about this because it sounds like you both got some very strong feelings. Uh, who wants to go first here? Go ahead, Chris. Well, I'm not surprised. Um, wow. I mean, <clears throat> this NIL thing is just going to be, I, I don't know. I, I think it's kind of, it could be the destruction of college football. It really could. I mean, you're going to have guys just coming and going when, you know, basically what it sounds like to me happening, correct me if I'm wrong, is Ryan Day wouldn't guarantee him he was going to get his, his required number of starts next year. So, as Eric said, he took his ball and went home. You know, his his, his NIL deal required he had so many starts so, well, I'm not going to get them. I'm going to go somewhere where I can't get them. It, it, it's very frustrating. It's very angry. And and I, I'm going to compare his behavior in this matter to to another well-known Texas quarterback who, uh, you know, went to A&M, which is where exactly I think uh, we're going to see Ewers wind up. He's 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 got a Johnny Menzel attitude about this game. I really feel that. Uh, he's he's completely in it for the money and not for the game. I believe. Um, I'm frustrated. I mean, frustrated, angry, irritated. He clearly is afraid to compete for the position. Um, so, you know, I was excited to see him come in. I had a lot of high hopes that he would do something for this program, but clearly it's not meant to be. Reluctantly wish him well. See you later. 
you know, we, we got another Texas kid coming in here who we'll talk about in a little bit who, I'm sorry, you talk kid, isn't it? Uh, who uh, just really, you know, I, I'm excited about. So I'm just going to close the book on yours with that. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't care if he has good luck or not. Bye. Yeah, it's it's clear to me at this point that he used Ohio State to get paid. And goodbye, dude. I I don't. I mean, I don't know what else to say. Um, I don't think that he. I, looking at his film and stuff, I know that we ran and raved over him because he had the approval of Pat Mahomes and all this stuff, you know. But at the end of the day, I think the new guy we're getting is actually better. And actually makes me question how Quinn Ewers got the rating that he got. And I, I'm i glad that he's gone because an attitude like his where, oh, I'm 17, 18 years old. I'm supposed to be in high school right now. But you know what? I'm going to try to strong arm one of the blue blood college football programs head coaches into letting me start. No, no, nah, dude, you got to go. Like, I'm glad he's gone. And I, I I really don't wish him good luck. I don't, you know, it's kind of a Tate Martell type situation where you're a, <laughs> ooh, I almost let a military slang word slip right there. Okay, so he's a bad person. <laughs> he's a bad person, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and I'm glad that he's gone. And I will go ahead and end that one right there because I almost let one slip. <laughs> go ahead, Chris. I know you is, is there Is this sense of entitlement, I mean – Oh yeah. Uh, the the sense of entitlement is just what gets me more than anything about some of these younger guys right now. I mean, yes, they they may be athletically gifted, but you know what? Yeah, you still got to go out there and earn it on the field. So <clears throat> there is a word to describe this younger generation, and I I have a feeling that. 99% of our listeners are our age or maybe a little older than us too. And so they're going to, they're going to understand me. And if there's anybody younger than me, it takes offense to this, please message me and tell me why I'm wrong. But the younger generation that we're seeing in athletics today, when I say younger generation, I'm talking about kids, you know, I'm talking about kids who are in college and some of the younger, younger guys in the NFL right now, and I'm seeing it in high school football, and I'm seeing it even down in the youth peewee football. I saw it this year on my stepson's team. You said you called it entitlement, Chris. I call it soft. There is a yeah. lot of soft kids. Sports used to teach us, Aaron, to be tough. When we would strike out in Little League Baseball and I'd go back to the dugout crying, you know what my dad and my coaches would tell me to do? Suck it up. Suck it up. <laughs> you weren't allowed to cry in baseball, right? Like that's not your, you're not allowed to do those things. Like you, you are tough. You do not show your opponent weakness. My gosh, are these kids soft? How, how would these kids respond to be gra being grabbed by the face mask and drug around the oh, field? Like the lawsuit, coaches used to do man. lawsuit. That's how yeah. they would respond. It'd be a lawsuit. Aaron, you're in the military. You are in the toughest environment in the world. You, at the same time, some of the older military guys even say you guys are softer than what they had to go through. I'm not saying that, Aaron, because I wasn't in your shoes. But you could probably respond in that nature by telling me if you think I'm right or wrong. Well, this is a whole different world uh, than what the civilian side is. So it's – I can't really compare it. I can tell you that there are some people who slip through the cracks that are softer than baby crap. But for the <laughs> most part, these kids are not – they're not like Quinn Ewers. They're not like Tate Martell. They're, they don't act like that. Some of them do. Yeah, that's – I mean I think you're going to get that just about everywhere. But sure. it's not nearly as prevalent here as it is on the outside world or the civilian side. So, I mean I, I can give you one example – from the Turkey Bowl a couple weeks ago that I played in, okay, I'm old school. I was raised just like you guys were. They grabbed you by the face mask or they smacked your helmet and it jarred you a little bit and it pissed you off, but you went out there and took it out on your opponents, right? Right. Well, I didn't cry. I didn't, you know, there was none of that. You didn't cry. You didn't. You just, you know, if you, if you broke your arm, well, your legs are fine. Get off the field. That's how it was, you know? Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, like, 
it's the truth. That's how it was. Um, but like today, like the, or not today, but a couple weeks ago, I actually uh, uh, they threw the ball. I was on defense. I was playing corner, and I actually got a lot of respect out of this somehow. But they threw the ball to this kid or this guy, and I hit him. Like I went to go break the ball up, but he positioned his body like right at the last minute so that I couldn't get there. But I hit him and he went straight down and I stood over him like, I don't know, just my instincts kicked in like that's, you know, you intimidate your opponents. I stood <laughs> over him. I didn't, you know, I didn't mean anything by it or nothing. But, it, you know, a lot of people were like, oh, you know, like they they saw it. They saw some old school. Like I might be 33 years old, but I'm still going to put some hit on you. You know what I mean? I'm gonna let you know that I'm there. They never did that to me. They never they never tried anything physical. Um, most of them anyway, but they thought that was really something. And to me, that was just a regular play. So I, it's just, it's how they view things. I don't know. That's the best way I can describe it. I, I thought that was kind of funny in retrospect, you know, cause they're like, Oh, uh, Sergeant Brown still got it. He's, you know, he's the real deal. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay. Yeah. It's, that was just a, a regular old play. Like it did nothing special just took place. Like, but yeah, I don't, I don't think that there's, soft in the military civilian side absolutely freaking lutely well you coached not that long <laughs> ago and you probably ran into some kids who were really athletic just natural ability but had been handed just about everything gotten a trophy no matter what a participation trophy no matter what through their whole life and all of a sudden they run into some some they run into some you know hard times and it's it, they're so soft Aaron it's like they just almost like give up because they've it's come so naturally and easily to them, and now all of a sudden they have to go out and earn it, and it's not so easy anymore. And you see that softness come to the surface. You know what I'm talking about? I do. I actually had a player exactly like what you're talking about. He was having a rough game. He was just having a bad game. He was getting beat on routes. Uh, he was a corner, and he was very gifted athletically. Like he was fast. He had great hands. He had a good football IQ, like he knew what was going on. You know, he was a very gifted athlete. Uh, I'm not going to say his name, but uh, he was very good. And he was having a rough game. We were playing Marysville and we were at Marysville and I had to pull him from the game because he was just he was stinking the place up and he did not like that. And I know most athletes don't get like they don't like getting pulled from games, but I mean, he darn near threw a tantrum on the sideline. And I had to yell at this kid in front of these in front of all these parents and, and, and fans and, and classmates and stuff. And there's no way it didn't humiliate him because, I mean, I treated him like he was a small child, like he was one of my kids or something because I had to. That's how he was acting. And he didn't play the rest of the game because I wasn't about to have somebody that emotional go back out on the field because who knows what was going to happen next. So I actually ended up taking his helmet and putting it on the bench. And I said, you're done for today. You can take your shoulder pads off, too. So, I mean, yeah, I, I have seen it. And this kid is just like you're saying, Eric. Everything was pretty much handed to him or it was very easy for him to attain mm -hmm. because of his athleticism. But that one moment, that one moment, he lost all his resiliency, all his class. It was gone in the snap. So. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. <clears throat> so, Chris, do you think that that is kind of maybe what's happened here to Quinn Ewers? <laughs> the rumor is he went into Ryan Day's office and and basically said to Ryan Day, "I need to be guaranteed that you're gonna you're, that I'm gonna be the starter next year." Now, <clears throat> some people have said it's because of the NIL contracts, and that is not true because you can't get paid to play, but we all know if you're not starting and not playing the NIL money, they're not going to keep giving it to you. Okay. Right. So he, he knows he needs to play, um, which means to me, his motivation is money, not getting better. Yes. That's that, yeah. that, that screams. I'm about the money. And until, until you are a, a professional athlete in the NFL, where it, it becomes an occupation and you have to look out for yourself and the future well-being uh, for you and your family. Until that, this NIL stuff, 
is just gravy. And the kid has earned a lot of gravy based on ranking, <coughs> based on a, as we're going to point out to you in a little bit, a fictitious rating given by people, some of which have never played a down of football in their life. And because yeah. of that, the kid earned millions and Aaron was right. I think he, Aaron or you won mentioned it earlier. The kid gave up on his teammates in high school a whole year in advance to go cash in, which I don't blame him. I mean, two, three million dollars is two or three million dollars. That's two or three million dollars more than what I've got. You know what I mean? But. What the heck, dude? Like, he he gonna- is also, Eric, he is also already decommitted from a school once to come to Ohio State. And now he's in the transport portal. In the last year, he is working on literally his fourth school when he should be working on his high school diploma. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, it, it, it's it's sad. But so he, he's in the portal, Chris. Um, he's not the only one. Uh, no. But that's the big one. So I, I made the comment last week. I felt like we were going to lose a guy because I think I don't – you don't go out and get a top five quarterback like that if you don't already know, which means this conversation probably took place before this week. Yeah. Which means this might have happened before the Michigan game. You follow me? Yep. Not good. Not good at all. Uh, any more thoughts, Chris, on yours in the in the portal before we move on to Craig Young? No. I think, I think okay. it's – I, I really do think, though, we are looking at a Johnny Manziel type personality here, and I just say good riddance to that because this team doesn't need that in the locker room. Yeah, there, there's a prima donna about him, the the the, the blonde mullet, which we all loved. I mean, it's it is cool. Uh, it it's is kind of cool, you know. It's it's definitely marketable. I give it to him. I give that to him. But there's a prima donna about it, and I told you guys. His body language. I th- go back and listen to some of the. Uh, I might have been the the Oregon game, when we came after the Oregon game. I told you guys in warmups, I didn't like his body language. I didn't like it then. So there was something going on there. <clears throat> He's not the only one in the portal from Ohio State. Uh, linebacker slash bullet defensive back Craig Young, redshirt sophomore Craig Young the. Super freak Craig Young, as uh, some called him in the offseason. He's in the portal. He finishes this season with um, 15 tackles total, six solo, one interception for 70 yards. That was a touchdown and then one pass deflection. Never could get on the field because, let's face it, Ronnie, the Rocket Hickman, was just so much better than him. So Craig Young's in the portal. Not surprised by this one. Um, what do you think, Chris? You surprised by Craig Young being in the portal? I'm not. I'm disappointed. I think he was a good player, added, you know, a lot of quality depth. But, you know, given the fact that we know that Hickman's going to be coming back this next year, um, I'm not surprised by it at all. This young man wants to get on the field. He wants to play ball. Um, so, no, I'm not. I'm not surprised by it. Aaron, you surprised by Craig Young <laughs> jumping in the portal? Uh, I'm not surprised. A little disappointed, I suppose, just because it it hurts our depth, you know. But I don't blame Craig Young. This is not a Quinn Ewer situation. This is Craig Young is talented enough to go play somewhere else, and he deserves to. It's it's just you know, like you said, Hickman is just a little. He's just that much better than than Young, and it just it's unfortunate for us that he's not sticking around, but. It is what it is, and I hope that he lands somewhere where he's going to get the playing time that he deserves. Yeah, um, we'll see. Um, the linebackers have been a, a mess this year, and uh, some people are upset because they felt Craig Young should have been a linebacker as opposed to being in the bullet. But, I mean, obviously the coaches, you know, they they didn't have him in the linebacker room for a reason, so – and they could have, they totally could have put him there um, if need be, but they didn't. So there was a reason for that. Um, <clears throat> all right. You mentioned it earlier, <laughs> Aaron, about Devin Brown, our new quarterback recruit from Utah, Draper, Utah, 
plays for Corner Canyon. He is a 6'3", 189-pound gunslinger, right-arm quarterback, ranked 52nd nationally by 247 Sports in the composite. He's ranked 5th by them uh, as the overall quarterback, 5th highest-ranked quarterback in the class. And he's first from the state of Utah. Funny how we're playing Utah now. And I, I watched his film, and I came away uber impressed. And we had a little chat before we started recording. And I said, I'm not so sure that Devin Brown might not be the better quarterback compared to Quinn Ewers. And you said, Aaron, thank you for mentioning that. You obviously got thoughts and feelings. Let's hear it. I do, because I've seen Quinn Ewers play, and the one time that he played in a state championship game, he got absolutely walloped. It wasn't even a close game. They lost by like 25 points, and he looked terrible. And and I'm not saying that's representative of his whole high school career, but I'll be honest. I don't know how he got the rating that he got being near perfect, because what I saw was a scared kid in a championship game, and that's that's – you mix that in with the fact that he struggled to learn our playbook. It could have been him knowing the whole time that he was going to leave. I don't know, but it was clear that he couldn't grasp the concept that Ryan Day is trying to do here. So when I think of a five-star near-perfect uh, recruit coming out of high school, I would think that his football IQ would be higher than what Quinn Ewers is. So I don't think that's much of a loss. This kid – I'm pretty sure is is a much better quarterback, and I think in the long term, we're gonna like this move. It might suck now, you know, a little bit of shock right now to the, to most people. Oh no, Quinn Ewers left. He's perfect. No, this kid is much closer to perfect from everything that I saw. I like he's got good deep ball skills. His ball placement is really nice. Uh, ability to extend the play is really good. He's not a fast, linear guy. In fact, I think that he ran like a 5-1 or a 5-2 40-yard dash. So you're not talking about Justin Fields here or Troy Smith or anybody like that. It's not even JT Barrett. But his footwork is such that he can extend plays, and he's strong. He may not be the biggest guy. Uh, I think, Eric, you said it. he's like 6'3", 190 or something. But yeah. Yeah, he's he's got room to build on that frame, and he will. You know, if we can get him to around 6'3", 215, or 210, that's an nfl size quarterback, my man. And he's got some spin on the ball now. He's got a little zip, all right? The only issue that I have with him is that sometimes he stares down his receivers. That's an easy fix, though. I'm not concerned about that. That's just right here, right now. It's not a huge deal. It can be broken. You know, and Ryan Day being a quarterback coach and knowing what he's doing, especially coming from a professional level, having played the position himself, I'm not concerned about that kind of thing. So I think that this kid, Devin Brown, is going to be a nice, a super nice addition. I would like to see him also, and this is part of uh, developing the game in his own right, but I'd like to see him uh, put the ball in tighter windows Now, it could be that his offense in high school just didn't allow for that because I noticed a lot of times his receivers were pretty open, but that's where his ball placement comes in because there were times where they would be running um, streak routes and the DB would be right there on the inside of the receiver and Devin Brown would put the ball on the receiver's outside shoulder, which is right where it should be. So that's, I mean, you take the good with the bad and then you consider the development and the improvement that he's going to make with Ryan Day, and we've got ourselves a quarterback of the future right here. I'm excited. This is a good get. Yeah. So I have been. Uh, <clears throat> I've, I've I watched. There's a there's a film out there. I don't know if you saw this one, Aaron, but there's a film. It's like ten ten and a half minutes long of his senior highlights. Yeah. Oh my gosh, is it just? It's incredible. It's but <clears throat> so the big quarterback offseason camp is called the elite 11 right it's the elite mm-hmm. top 11 guys who go and compete against one of another they have juniors and seniors you know so they'll have like 11 juniors 11 seniors whatever and um the offseason when they were all there um and they get graded this guy had a higher grade than quinn ewers at the elite 11 
Now, I understand that it's a camp, so that's not everything. But that meant that the experts at Elite 11 who were grading these guys said he's better than Quinn Ewers, at least on that camp. Just throwing it out there. Okay. Anyways, watching this this film, you said uh, he, he doesn't have great speed, but he's got good pocket awareness. He's got some elusiveness. Um, he's got Craig Krenzel legs, guys. Like, I, I totally see him being used like Craig Krenzel was running the football. Can you give me five or six, you know, yards here or there? Can if on, on a third and one, can you give me two? That's this kind of guy right here. He's not a JT Barrett. He's not definitely not a Braxton Miller. He's not a Justin Fields. But he will use his legs like Craig Krenzel did. And then his arm is much more, <coughs> I would say, like a um, Dwayne Haskins. Would you say that's a fair comparison, Aaron? I'd say Dwayne Light. He's not too far off, but yeah, yeah. that's a, that's close. I mean, he's got he's got a really good arm. Anyways, here's the notes I wrote down after watching the film. I said strong arm with touch on his deep ball, good pocket awareness, isn't afraid to one run the ball. He literally can make almost every pass. I mean, every highlight in there. He's he's scrambling and throwing. He's rolling and throwing. He's he's moving up into the pocket and throwing. He's throwing in the tight windows. He's doing this the CJ Stroud and throwing low on purpose throw to make sure that the defender can't get to it uh, to where only his receiver can catch. He did the back shoulder fade. He did the fade in the corner of the end zone. And this is a high school kid. I'm just like, "Man, this is an incredible film." Now I understand that film showing only the highlights. But my gosh, that's a lot of highlights, man, over and over and over and over again, multiple times in the same games. I was uber impressed. Chris, what do you think of Devin Brown, our new uh, quarterback recruit in the class of 2022? I think he's going to be a great fit. Um, You know, like Aaron said, not extremely fast. He has great footwork, though. He moves around the pocket well. He has that that pocket awareness. like I said before we started, the one thing that concerned me a little is sometimes, you know, he, uh, you know, the, the receivers had to break off or slow down. He wasn't hitting them in stride on a few. But you know what? Like you said, too, high school kid, this is something that's going to get better. Uh, great arm. Um, I, I really think he reminds me a lot. You mentioned Krenzel, but let me tell you, he reminds me a lot of a quarterback that played for Urban Meyer out of Utah. And that's Alex Smith. Mm, that's similar size, person. similar size. I think the the physical tools are are very similar. I mean, when Smith ended up in the uh, in the NFL, he was only at about two fifteen, so right about where Aaron had mentioned. Um, yeah, I think that he is. I, I think he's a great pickup, and I think he's going to fit well into the system. Again, he and he's tough. That's the other thing. I think he showed toughness. Yeah. Um, which, again, you know, we all have been a little critical of CJ for not running this year. Um, but yeah, he he showed a toughness, and he was willing to run the ball. Like you said, he's not gonna he's not gonna have Braxton type runs or JT type runs. Uh, but you know, he can get some yards for you on the ground. And if we're going to continue to run an offense that has the RPO in it, we need that. I think that he's yeah. a great pickup for this system. Good. Thank you for mentioning that, the RPO. Aaron, did you see that highlight where he's running the read pass options and he faked out everyone, including the like camera guy? Like Everyone thought the running back had the ball on the RPO. Yeah, everybody was like, going right and yeah. he's running left. Yeah, he just kind of walks in the end zone like, okay, cool. <laughs> like, where'd everybody go? I'm like, man, that's the one thing I think is missing from C.J. Stroud's game. One of the things that this kid's got is got. And I imagine as that that was kind of a, that's kind of a relatively new thing for high school football is running that RPO. But this kid's got it in his pocket already, Aaron. Well, I can tell you um, it's it is relatively new, like as in within the last six to seven years. Uh, cause we ran it at Olentangy. So 
uh, but running it to the level that this kid runs it, that's different, okay? Because <laughs> he runs it really well. I agree. His his ball fake skills are top notch, and the fact that he can throw it on the run without losing any zip to it, that's another skill that is incredibly underrated. Like that is that's massive. You got to have that, and he does have it. That's that's hand size, arm strength, upper body strength is what that is to be able to zip the ball like that with just a flick of your wrist, you know, um, oh, yeah. that's a, that's a tough thing to do. Um, I, I, I was a catcher in, in, in high school, um, in college. So I, I understand how, what it takes to zip the ball to second base. And I developed over time, the ability to throw runners out from my knees as opposed to, you know, catching the ball and then getting, you know, it's jumping up and then throwing the baseball that, that split second of that that takes away if you can do that just whip the ball back and throw it to first or second base from your knees saves i think it was like 0.25 seconds but that 0.25 seconds in at higher level athletics is the difference between out and safe and as a quarterback i relate it to that to being able to just zip the ball really fast by a flip of the wrist that's the difference between a first down and a pass deflection on third and short, you know? And it's and as we learned in the Big 12 yesterday, football is literally still a game of inches, my man. You're not wrong. I mean, it's, there's you said it perfectly. That's that's that was real talk. That's that's how it is. That that little bit of time is everything. That's the difference between being able to throw into a tight window and not being able to throw into a tight window. That's I mean, it's I couldn't set it any better. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the coaching carousel. Um, Marcus Freeman was announced as the head coach of the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. And guys, as Ohio State fans, we can't ignore this. This is big. This is this is huge. Um, I'm just going to straight come right out and say it before I get your reactions on it. And then before we hit on hit on recruiting now. I think Notre Dame got better by Kelly leaving and Freeman taking over as the head coach. Aaron, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Um, I don't know about X's and O's quite yet, but I can tell you their defense won't miss a won't miss a beat. Um, but that Cincinnati area, I'm not going to say he's got it on lock because of Luke Fickle, but it's uh, Luke Fickle's recruiting is certainly going to take a little bit of a hit right there. The Indianapolis area that we like to go into a little bit. Uh, that's going to take a little bit of a hit. Uh, the players, he's a player's coach. They love him. And that the news of that is going to spread throughout the recruiting community. And these guys are going to now give Notre Dame an extra look. Yeah. So that's, I mean, it's, it sounds kind of like a, not a big deal, but it really is. It really, really is. Yes. It is a huge deal. So it puts us a little a little bit at peril uh, on the recruiting trail in yep. the, like, you know, within that little three hour radius that we like to go to. Yeah. Chris, your thoughts, my man. Well, yeah, Aaron nailed it. I mean, and it, it you know, it was tough enough recruiting the Midwest with Fickle bringing Cincinnati to prominence and competing with the other Big Ten schools. But now you've got Marcus Freeman, who I, I'm, I, the, the guy has the reputation as, as Aaron said, he is a player's coach and I'll tell you right now, do you know what scares me more than anything about this is his sunny style is going to start thinking again. Oh crap. I didn't even think about that. That just jumped into my head immediately when I saw this. Mm, I don't think it does. I don't think it does. I, I really hope not, but it, it's a de- definite concern. I don't think he does because he said that he wants to not live in his brother's shadow. And the only way to do that is to not play on the same team. Yeah, but you went to the school where your dad casts a shadow. <laughs> so Yeah, uh, but it's been 30 years. That is true. That it's is not that, like Malik and, and his brother, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we already lost one five-star recruit from the state of Ohio in the class of 2023 and the defensive end Vernon. Uh, I think it was, was it Vernon Davis? Was that who, was that his name? Um, no, can't remember uh, his name. Vernon, 
Vernon Davis was a tight end for the sporting. Vernon, uh, uh, oh, thank you. Um, mentor. He was from Mentor, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah, he was from. Yeah, he was up from the Northeast. Anyways, he uh, he went to Notre Dame. He chose Notre Dame, and and Marcus Freeman. He came out right out and said Marcus Freeman was one of the reasons why. And of course, now he felt that Notre Dame was just a better fit for him as a person. But you know, that's neither here nor there. The fact is, and you and you said it, Aaron. Um, Notre Dame has a still a pretty strong foothold on Catholic school kids. And uh, and now you have not only that aspect of things when you go into someone's house to recruit, but now you have someone from Ohio State from Ohio going in and recruiting. And this this is a big deal to Ohio State and this coaching staff, I'm telling you. And then not to mention not, not only that. We play Notre Dame to open the season next year. I remember the last time there was a young hire from within in a giant program that we ended up playing and won Oklahoma with Lincoln Riley. And I thought, oh, we got this one now because Lincoln Riley's young. He's not he's going to get out coached by Urban Meyer. And then he and Baker Mayfield came into Ohio Stadium and planted a flag on the 50 yard line. I don't know if any of you guys remember that. Uh, I sure do. This kind of feels like that a little bit. Marcus Freeman coming home. He's not going to be intimidated. This was his home, man. And he's got a he's going to have a very talented group of of Irish kids uh ready to take on the Buckeyes next year. This this game just got real real quick, man. Uh any thoughts on that before we move on? Nope. Nothing really. No. I, I can't really add anything to that. I think we got a pretty good winning streak right now going up against Notre Dame. I think we've beaten them last three or four times in a row, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, this is going to be this is going to be very very interesting. And oh, by the way, you know how we were talking about one James Laurinaitis um, being a linebackers coach for Ohio State? Yes. Guess what he said on the radio this week after Freeman got announced? Hire him. He said, "Marcus, my buddy, you're my good friend." Why don't you call me up? I'd love to coach linebackers. Oh, I'm like, you've got oh, man. to be kidding me. If Ryan Day heard that and doesn't give this man a phone call, he is the next John Cooper. Because that right there is <laughs> yeah. a home run hire in your back freaking yard. Call yep. him. I mean, if he's willing to go to Notre Dame to coach with his good friend at linebackers, you know he's willing to coach linebackers at his alma mater. You I think. mean, he lives right here in Columbus. He wouldn't even have to move. Yeah, yeah, you would think. Let's hope you it would, happens. You would you would think. <clears throat> All right, guys. Um, let's talk about how things went yesterday for our prediction, shall we, as we end this show. So as I open up uh, our predictions from the weekend, here we go. <clears throat> Friday night, Oregon, Utah. All three of us said Utah. All three of us were correct. 12 noon, Big 12, down there in the big heart of Texas, Baylor, OSU. That was the game of the day. Oh, my gosh. Did you guys, any of you guys get a chance to watch that thing? Which game was it? Baylor and Oklahoma State. I watched no. the second half, yes. Okay. Oh, I mean, you want to talk about Oklahoma storming back, Oklahoma State, that is, making it a game, getting the football, going on a game-winning drive, <coughs> having it first and goal, no timeouts with a minute and a half inside the 10-yard line, and Baylor shutting the door, including a, a, a run on fourth and short where the running back is reaching out for the pylon and literally just misses it. By an inch to a half an inch, and that's how the game ends. That was an incredible football game. And, Aaron, we've been saying that they don't play defense in the Big 12. They did Saturday. Those two teams were two of the best defensive teams in the Big 12, which is probably why they were there. Uh, great game. Baylor wins. Aaron and you, Aaron, you and Chris both won that one. I lost. <coughs> SEC. Uh, Aaron, you and I said Georgia. Boy, were we wrong. Bama ends up winning again, and the the Satan Saban curse continues down south. All three of us said Cincinnati. Uh, Cincinnati won. Oh, I don't know if I said that, but Chris, you pre you rightly predicted the Bama game. 
Uh, Big Ten, you had Aaron and myself predicting that team up north. Chris, you went with the wild card in Iowa. Uh, that didn't go so well for you because the team up north so much. stomped the Hawkeyes. Uh, what was the final score? Like 42 to 42 to three. Ugh. I, I, I couldn't finish it. I ended up going to bed. And then uh, another interesting game, Aaron, you and Chris both went with Wake Forest, and you both lost. I went with Pitt. Did you guys see the Pitt quarterback fake the slide, where and then all the defenders stopped to not yeah, hit that's, him? Yeah, that's going to cause all kinds of turmoil down the road. That was a slippery slope he just opened up right there. Yeah. Because I'll tell you what, you were going to have one of two things happen. Either they're going to have to reevaluate this rule and make it a penalty to fake the slide, or you're going to get quarterbacks getting their heads taken off. Yeah, I think what they'll mm. probably do is they'll say when you start the slide, that's where you play ends, and they will they'll call it dead right there. Yeah, but how do you <laughs> protect them in the moment? Because the guys are in motion, so I mean – That's the thing. They literally – the defenders stopped the motion of tackling because they saw him go into the slide, and he literally stops himself on a dime with his left foot and almost kind of crow hops, skips up and yeah. continues running. And they're all, the defender's like, oh, crap, he didn't slide. But they all stopped so they wouldn't hit him. Uh, weird. I've never seen anything like it. He's getting all kinds of praise for it, but you're right, Chris. I think that's a slippery slope. And immediately I thought, how can you blame these defenders right now? Like that's yeah. you, you've, you've handcuffed them so much that a play like that is just impossible for them. And now so, you've opened the door. And now that's, you've opened the, the door thing. for that to become a thing. So you better shut it quickly. Anyways, you guys went with Wake Forest. I went with Pitt. I beat you guys on that one, which means, Aaron, you went – let me count it up here real quick. You went one, two, three. You went four and two. Chris, you went one, two, three, four and two. And I went one, two, three, four, four and two. We all went four and two. Imagine that, which means, Aaron, Chris, you are both still 39 and 24. Yours truly hangs on by the skin of his teeth, 40 and 23. How did I get so lucky? I Bowl season's coming up, Eric. Bowl season's coming up. <laughs> these these <laughs> these results are fixed, guys. Yeah, I, I got so much money to fix it. That's for sure. Oh, hey, I got <laughs> some breaking news. <laughs> what you got? Mario Cristobal is going to be the next head coach at Miami, Florida. Uh, I thought that was going to come. Yeah. Well, as soon as I saw Joe Moorhead leave to go to like Kent State or something, I don't know where he ended up. Toledo, maybe. But either way, when I saw him leave Oregon, I was like, dude, that's that's probably a that's bad the beginning sign. the end. Yeah. Well, do you think Oregon goes after Chip Kelly again? They might. They Come very on well home. May. Yeah. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. <clears throat> All right, guys, that's our show for today. Uh, we will be back in a week. We will have our big bowl game prediction show. Um, we'll have some recruiting to talk about because the early signing period is just around the corner. I think it's uh, the 17th, if I'm not mistaken. So literally 12 days away. And um, so we'll have all of that to talk about. And then we will get right into the Rose Bowl where we start previewing Ohio State and Utah <coughs> to end the season. So I hope <coughs> – excuse me. I hope to get better by then. I was doing really good till we started recording. My goodness. Anyways, <clears throat> we are going to uh, hopefully have a live show for you soon. Aaron is on his way up to the great state of Ohio here soon. Um, and we hope to try to all get together before he goes back down to the sunny state of Texas uh, to just make us feel all bad as he posts pictures about how wonderful the weather is in January and February and March. But – Beside the point, he at least will have to endure the cold weather here in December with us for a few weeks. Looking forward to having Aaron. Haven't seen him in a couple years. But that's beside the point. We're going to have some uh, shows for you here. And, of course, next week, like I said, we'll get right into our uh, bowl season preview. All right, guys, that's it for now. Be kind to one another. I owe someone's OH and sing Carmen, Ohio with all your heart. And until next time, OH! I owe! I owe! Go Bucks. Oh, come, let's sing, oh, 
pious praise and songs through Alma Mater rain. While our hearts rebounding thrill and joy which death alone can still. Summer's heat, oh, oh, winter's cold. The seasons pass, the years will roll. Time and change will surely show how firm thy friendship. Oh, high, oh.